on World News Tonight. Intensifying Rivalry US-China tension stakes center stage at the 20th Shangri-La Dialogue. Apple revolutionizing. Apple's new augmented reality headset unveiled, a first major hardware launch for almost a decade. New Challenger. Donald Trump's closest former ally Mike Pence submits his nomination for the 2024 presidential round. And Sydney lights up. Australian art takes center stage as Vivid Festival lights up Sydney. is other than in a world news tonight reporting from colombo here is suzanne chanelli good evening to you all and you are watching world news tonight now as tensions between the united states and china are at a historical high the 20th shangri-la dialogue a prominent asian defense forum was dominated by this topic despite the conclusion of the event contentious issues especially those revolving around the taiwan strait remain unresolved Curtains came down on the 20th Shangri-La Dialogue at the weekend, but not before underscoring tensions between two global superpowers, the U.S. and China. This rising friction threaded through the entire event. Mutual respect should prevail over bullying and hegemony. Facts have proven that where there is hegemony in power politics, there will be no peace and wars will abound. The defense chiefs from the two countries didn't even get a chance to sit down for one-on-one -on -one talks, with Li Xiangfu turning down American counterpart Lloyd Austin's calls for discussions. All the pair shared was a handshake during the opening reception. And a cordial handshake over dinner is no substitute for a substantive engagement. And the more that we talk, the more we can avoid the misunderstandings and miscalculations that could lead to crisis or conflict. Much of the conflict stems from the discord over the Taiwan Strait, with both sides refusing to budge from their stances. But we are determined to maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. And so are a number of countries around, of the countries around the world, and that number continues to grow. Let China make it clear once again. The more ramped up the separatist activity for Taiwan independence, the more resolute our countermeasures will be and all foreign interference will end in failure. Meanwhile, the forum was paralleled by a tense incident taking place in the Taiwan Strait. A Chinese warship came alarmingly close to an American destroyer during a joint Canada-US mission. The standoff reflected how brewing tensions between U.S. and China continue to pose a problem, with the Shangri-La Dialogue concluding no closer to a resolution. In the second major provocations by China's military in the span of a week, a Chinese warship carried out what the U.S. military called an unsafe maritime interaction when it crossed an American warship's bow at a distance of 150 yards, forcing the U.S. Navy destroyer to take evasive maneuvers to avoid a collision. The U.S. Navy has released a video of what it calls a, quote, unsafe interaction with a Chinese warship, in which the Chinese ship cuts in front of a U.S. vessel within 150 yards. The U.S. military said its destroyer, the USS Chung-Hoon, as well as the Canadian frigate, were conducting a routine transit of the sensitive Taiwan Strait at the time. In the video, the Chinese ship can be seen sailing across the path of the destroyer, which reportedly had to slow down to avoid a collision. Canadian Navy Commander Paul Mountfort witnessed the incident firsthand. The fact that this was announced over the radio prior to doing it clearly indicated that it was intentional. Maneuvering close to each other, 150 yards is very scary. Uh, and you, you don't ever want to be that close to another vessel because too many things can go wrong and you can actually have a collision. China's military has rebuked the United States and Canada for the joint exercise. And on Monday, Beijing said their ship operated in a legal and safe manner. On Sunday, Taiwan's defense ministry called on China to respect the right to freedom of navigation. China views Taiwan as its own territory, a claim the government in Taipei strongly rejects. The incident comes as Beijing and Washington traded blame for not holding military talks. Tension between the two over trade, Taiwan, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine has escalated in recent weeks. This is the second such encounter in recent days. 
On May 26, the U.S. said a Chinese fighter jet carried out a, quote, unnecessarily aggressive maneuver near a U.S. military plane in international airspace over the South China Sea. Oil prices climbed after Saudi Arabia vowed to restrict output by 1 million barrels per day beginning in July to counteract adverse macroeconomic factors that have depressed markets. Global oil prices rose on Monday. International benchmark Brent crude was up over 2% by mid-afternoon. The jump came after a weekend pledge by Saudi Arabia to cut output by 1 million barrels per day. That comes on top of reductions announced earlier. The Saudi energy minister called it a sweet treat for prices. And, uh, I would have to call it the Saudi lollipop, which is a million barrel of reduction uh, for the start that starts at the 1st of July. And it, that million is also extendable. The Saudi move was announced at a gathering of the OPEC group of oil producing nations in Vienna. It's meant to prop up prices as flagging global growth saps demand. OPEC Plus, which includes Russia, pumps around 40% of the world's crude. The group had already cut its output target by over 3.6 million barrels per day. Analysts say Saudi Arabia seems determined to keep prices above $80 per barrel in a bid to balance its own budget for the year. Even after the latest cuts, however, oil prices were still sitting just below that level. Some also question how much substance there is in the moves on output. Lower targets set for Russia, Nigeria and Angola appear to merely bring them into line with actual production levels. Rail services have resumed over a stretch of the railway network in eastern India where a train crash uh, killed 275 people as an investigation into the disaster began. Around 1,200 people were also injured in Friday's rail crash, India's worst uh, for more than two decades, which has been blamed on a signalling failure. India opened an official investigation on Monday into its deadliest rail crash in more than two decades. Initial findings suggest signal failure caused the collision that killed at least 275 people and wounded around 1,200 in the eastern state of Odisha. Scores of bodies have yet to be identified and desperate relatives were still scouring hospitals and mortuaries. Disaster struck on Friday when the Coromandel Express passenger train hit a stationary freight train, jumped the tracks and hit another passenger train travelling in the opposite direction. Trains resumed running on a repaired section of the line, crawling past mangled compartments and workers by the trackside. About 75 miles away in Karagpur in West Bengal state, railway officials and witnesses gathered to submit evidence to a two-day inquiry led by the Rail Safety Commissioner. The computer-controlled track management system is suspected to have malfunctioned when it allowed the Coromandel Express to move onto a loop track where trains were parked. It hit the stationary freight train at 80 miles per hour. That crash caused the engine and first four or five coaches of the moving passenger train to jump the tracks, topple and hit the last two coaches of a train heading in the opposite direction at a similar speed. Mike Pence, the former vice president of the United States, launched his hotly anticipated bid to run for president, a challenge for his one-time boss, Donald Trump. The papers filed with the Federal Election Commission showed that Pence has officially joined the candidates who are contesting to be the Republican 2024 presidential nominee. Riding his way into the presidency race, Mike Pence has officially thrown his name into the ring as a Republican candidate for 2024's presidential election. The paperwork declaring his campaign has been filed and a formal announcement is expected on Wednesday in Iowa. And I have to tell you, over the last two years, Karen and I have spent a lot of time reflecting and praying about, about everything in this country is dealing with and what we might do to serve. And I don't have anything to announce today, but I can tell you, when I got time to announce, come this Wednesday, I'm announcing in Iowa. <laughs> His biggest rival will, of course, be Donald Trump, the man he served as vice president between 2017 and 2021. Pence was a loyal defender of the president for those four years, 
but he's distanced himself from his old boss since the riot by Trump supporters at the US Capitol in January 2021. Trump had pressured Pence to overturn Joe Biden's election victory, which he refused. Some rioters were heard chanting, hang Mike Pence, as they stormed the halls of Congress. And many Trump loyalists view him as a traitor. Pence is just another name to add to an ever-growing list of Republican candidates. A list which includes Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who is seen as Trump's closest contender, as well as former Governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley. Many experts are describing this race for the Republican nomination as one of the most right-wing the party has ever seen. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Now, Apple has innovated again by introducing the world to wonders of spatial computing by announcing a long-anticipated new headset and platform called Vision Pro. CEO uh, Tim Cook called spatial computing profound technology with revolutionary potential during the climactic minutes of the company's annual Worldwide Developers Conference. Introducing Apple Vision Pro. Apple unveiled its hotly anticipated augmented reality headset on Monday, its riskiest and biggest bet since the iPhone debuted more than a decade ago. The Vision Pro poses a direct challenge to Meta's line of mixed and virtual reality devices. And with a price tag that will start at $3,499, the Vision Pro will cost more than three times Meta's priciest headset when it launches next year. Apple CEO Tim Cook. It's the first Apple product you looked through and not at. Vision Pro feels familiar, yet it's entirely new. You can see, hear, and interact with digital content just like it's in your physical space. Apple said that users of the Vision Pro will be able to select content inside the goggles with their eyes, tap their fingers together to click, and gently flick to scroll, while also using a three-dimensional camera and microphone system to capture videos and pictures that can be viewed in 3D later. In its most striking difference from Meta's headsets, the device also has an exterior display that shows the user's eyes to people in the outside world. So in the same way that Mac introduced us to personal computing and iPhone introduced us to mobile computing, Apple Vision Pro will introduce us to spatial computing. The exterior screen goes dark when a user is fully immersed in a virtual world. When a person approaches a user who is in a full virtual mode, the headset will show both the user and the outside person to each other. For work uses, Apple showed how the headset can be used with a trackpad and keyboard to work like a traditional computer with multiple displays. The Vision Pro has two hours of use with an external battery, similar to Meta's top-of-the-line Quest Pro mixed reality device. Besides the headset, Apple also displayed a raft of new products and features, including a 15-inch MacBook Air, a powerful chip called M2 Ultra, and improvements to its iOS software and autocorrect feature. Shares of the iPhone maker rose 2% to hit a record high ahead of the launch, but shares ended slightly lower after the announcement. In what may be their final efforts to persuade lawmakers to overturn an existing law, French unions will demonstrate for a 14th day against the government's plans to raise their retirement age to 64. Tens of thousands of people expected in the streets of Paris on Tuesday and police forces on high alert. At this marketplace in Toulouse, opinions are divided over whether the battle against the pension reform is still worth fighting. For me, it's a done deal. It's over. Under President Chirac, wasn't there a law that was voted through? And then we backtracked. 250 different marches are expected across the country in what will be the 14th day of mass mobilisation. But the government is still showing no signs of backing down. On Sunday, it published the first two decrees for implementing the reform. That's not been enough to discourage trade unions and opposition parties, though. They say it's not too late to reverse the legislation. Meanwhile, Parliament is gearing up to examine an article on Thursday that would reintroduce an amendment to bring back the pension age to 62 from 64. But the National Assembly's president has already threatened to rule it as ineligible for review. 
Over in Ukraine, Russian military authorities claim Ukraine has launched its counteroffensive with little success. Kyiv has not confirmed the attacks, but saying Moscow is spreading false information. Russia has claimed that Ukraine has started its highly anticipated counteroffensive, but has failed to make any progress. Moscow's defense ministry on Monday said that Kyiv launched the offensive in the southern Donetsk region on Sunday morning, deploying six mechanized battalions and two tank battalions. The enemy did not achieve its goals. It had no success. As a result of the skillful and calculated actions of the East Group, the Ukrainian army suffered losses of more than 250 people, 16 tanks, three armored personnel carriers and 21 armored vehicles. Though Ukraine did not address Russia's claims, its Center for Strategic Communications of the Armed Forces said on Telegram that Russian propagandists will spread false information to demoralize Ukrainians and mislead the community, though it did not address Russia's claims directly. Also during his interview with the Wall Street Journal on Saturday, the 3rd, President Volodymyr Zelensky said Ukraine is ready for the counteroffensive and that he strongly believes it will succeed against Russia. Tensions are escalating with a drone attack setting an energy facility on fire in Russia's western region of Belgorod on Monday morning. The city, which borders Ukraine, has been used as a military base by the Russian army and also saw guerrilla warfare from pro-Ukrainian Russian militia last month. Meanwhile, Russia said on Monday that it began naval drills in the Baltic Sea that will last until June 15th. Up to 40 ships and boats, 25 aircraft, and around 3,500 personnel will take part in the exercise. This comes a day after NATO member states kicked off their annual drills in the same area. Global airlines increased their prediction for the industry's earnings in 2023 by more than doubling it, but they also issued a warning that the post-pandemic recovery could be hampered by delays in pro uh, procuring planes to meet the increasing demand. The world's airlines are holding their annual get-together this year in Istanbul, and they meet in bullish mood. Carriers have more than doubled their profit forecast for the industry this year, lifting it to $9.8 billion that as travel demand soars after the global health crisis. Fuel prices also show signs of easing. International Air Transport Association Chief Willie Walsh sat down with us ahead of the body's annual summit. He says demand really isn't the issue for airlines anymore. You know, they're not concerned about the macroeconomic environment. They're concerned about the uh, access to spare parts for their existing aircraft and the delivery of new aircraft. So it's definitely going to hold back capacity growth. I think it's frustrating because airlines can see strong demand, but they're not able to match supply with demand in many markets. Soaring airport charges are also a concern. Walsh singled out Amsterdam's Schiphol hub as one that was making life hard for airlines. The industry also fears a repeat of the chaos caused at major airports by staff shortages and strike action. But Walsh says the trouble may come elsewhere. Most of the airports, uh, I think, will be OK as well. Uh, I think they've learned the lessons from last year. But the, the areas that we are concerned about this year, air traffic control, uh, it's a European issue and it's a US issue principally. Um, and to some degree, uh, you know, we may see some border control issues as well. Airlines around the world, from Qantas to Ryanair, have lifted their forecasts for the summer. Many say people are desperate to travel again after years of lockdowns and aren't put off by high ticket prices. The next few months will put those predictions to the test. Welcome back to World News and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Flooding from torrential rains in Haiti has left at least 42 people dead over the past couple of days and dozens more missing and injured. Over 13,600 homes are also listed as flooded. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission alleged that the world's largest crypto exchange Binance and its CEO Changpeng Zhao operated a web of deception that included artificially inflating its trading volumes and diverting custom assets. A thick cloud of pollution hovered over the skyline of Chile's capital Santiago, a climatologist 
says Santiago is now the American continent's most polluted capital. Canada is on track for its worst ever year of wildfire destruction as warm and dry conditions are forecast to persist through the end of summer after an unprecedented start of the fire season. Pakistan's Zimbabwe former Prime Minister Imran Khan accused the powerful military and its intelligence agency of openly trying to destroy his political party and said that he had no doubt he would be tried in a military court and thrown in jail. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with Australian art taking center stage as the Vivid Festival lights up Sydney. Stay safe and have a good night. <laughs>